Cartier Brown hosts the Food Network's Delicious Miss Brown and the Great Soul Food Cook-Off on the OWN Network. She also is the creator of the pop-up New Gullah Supper Club, where her cuisine pays homage to her grandmother's cooking and her Gullah Geechee heritage. She has also appeared on Beat Bobby Flay, Chopped Junior, and Family Food Showdown, among other culinary programs. Tonight she is here in celebration of her debut cookbook, The Way Home. She'll be joined in conversation this evening with longtime Philadelphia chef and restaurant owner, Valerie Irwin. Miss Irwin currently manages Farm to Families, a produce access program for children. Please join me in welcoming our guests to the Free Library. Nice, y'all came dressed up. <laughs> All right. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, so I want to start out by saying um, I very seldom see cooking shows on television because you need streaming and cable, and I don't have streaming or cable, and I don't even really have a television. There's a television in my sister's room, and I watch that. And the only time I ever see cable shows or something like that is if I'm on vacation. So one time, like, you know, this past year, I was on vacation with my sisters, and I, and I see this show with this, this young woman named Cartier. And, and I, really, it was almost like when I was a kid, and you saw a color person on television, and you wanted to call, call, call your family, everybody, look, look. And it's like, <laughs> look, there's somebody cooking food from the low country. I, I was astonished. So, so be, be that, and I'm just amazed that I even knew who you were because I don't have, I don't have cable television. Okay. But it, it was meant to be. It absolutely was. And you know, I'm, I'm fangirling. I'm trying to act normal, but <laughs> this is this is Geechee Low Country royalty right here. So I'm just gonna, uh, I'm, gonna I'm being composed. So, um, you know, obviously we're here to talk about your book, and I know that in the subtitle it's called A Celebration of Sea Island Food and Family. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the Sea Islands. Oh, gosh, it's beautiful. <laughs> so my family, and I know everyone's familiar with the show, but my family is actually from Wad Malaw. Is anyone not familiar with the Sea Islands outside of the show? Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So there's like a little cluster of islands off the coast of South Carolina, North Carolina, and the very like s northern tip of, no of, of Florida that's including like Jacksonville as well. Um, so these uh, corridor or the Sea Island quarters or Gullah Geechee quarter, um, there exist these little islands. And so my family's from Wadmala Island and the islands uh, is where uh, slaves from the West uh, well, sorry, the transatlantic slave trade were kind of shipped to uh, because they had this vast knowledge of growing rice because the area was so perfect for growing rice and they knew, well settlers knew that West African people had knowledge of that and so they brought them over to the Sea Islands and because they lived in so much isolation that they were able to hold on to their roots, the culture, the food, um, and I am a direct descendant of West African enslaved people from those Sea Islands. Sullivan's Island, John's Island, James Island, Edisto Island, Hutchison family, um, and uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very brief description because we can go on all night about that. Well, you know what, that, that leads right into my next question, because I know that in your book you talk about your family being from, how do you say it? Wadmala. Wadmala. But your show is on Edisto. Yes. So can you tell us how are they similar, how are they different? Well, um, Edisto and, and, and Wadmala are, are just basically one and the same. They're just in different areas on the mm -hmm. Sea Islands. Um, my family that's on Wadmala are my grandmother's. Um, family, and then my family on Edisto is my, uh, there are my distant relatives, the Hutchison family, um, and so, I mean, the, the culture is the same, the food is the same, the accent is the same, um, it's just a different area of the Sea Islands. And I know that you're really involved in trying to preserve um, 
at a show. So you want to tell, tell us about that a little bit? Okay, so the, um, I've, you guys remember the episode I did on the Hutchison House? That episode meant so much to me because Henry Hutchison, who's a, a, a late descendant of uh, the Hutchison family, that was so important for me to, for that to happen because that's the only um, standing house of a freed slave. Um, Henry Hutchison was one of the most wealthiest black men on Edisto Island. So um, it was very important for me to uh, be a part of that because, I mean, how often can you say that there was a black man who was able to preserve, actually build that house from with his bare hands um, and to preserve such a beautiful land and, and, and culture? Because fast forward to today, a lot of the sea islands are just, you know, taken over by mm -hmm. infrastructure, um, million dollar homes, you know, all of those things. So it was just very important for me to be a part, not only of the preservation of Edisto, but also Wadmalaw Island as well too. So one thing I wanted to ask you, because your family does come from the Sea Islands, so when you were growing up, did your, did your family refer to themselves as being Gala, or did they refer to themselves as being Geechee? Absolutely. I was, I was told that from the very beginning, like, girl, you Geechee. <laughs> and I, you know, it's so funny because my grandmother was the only uh, person out of our family to, to get a college education out of her 14 siblings. And so she moved to New York for a better life for her children. Um, but it was, it was one of those things is like you can take the girl off the island, but you can't take the island out of the girl. And so my grandmother kept her Geechee roots no matter what. She, she still cooked the very same things in New York, you know, was rice with every dish. I mean, literally like rice for breakfast, rice for lunch, <laughs> rice for snacks, rice for dinner. <laughs> um, and so I, I was, I, it was embedded in me very, very early that I was Geechee and of Gullah descent. I knew that. Um, but I didn't know the importance of that until I moved away. And I met other people that were like, girl, do you know you were, you know, direct descendant of, I, I knew what it was to be Gullah and Geechee, but I didn't know the ties until I went to college and they were like, you know, I met a, a, a custodian from Sierra Leone and she said, you know, your people are my people. And I said, well, you mm -hmm. know me from girl. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, no, you know, we, we are of the same um, background and ancestry. Your people are from Sierra Leone, they're from uh, Ghana, they're from Liberia, um, even as far as the Ivory Coast. So we are one and the same. And once she said that to me, it kind of got me thinking and researching. And the more I researched, the more I was like, well, it isn't so bad to have this twang. Because a lot of times you're taught be, growing up on the Sea Islands that the broken patois was was not my well my grandmother actually was taught that that you know that mm -hmm. patois was not proper English, mm -hmm. so you can't talk like that because you know that broken English is not going to get you far. But as I did my research, I realized like this broken English is history. It's rich. There's meaning behind it. So I don't know if I answered your question, but oh, you know, no, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Ooh, I'm and hot, y'all. Y'all hot. You know what? I think we're, we're under lights. <laughs> that they are not under. Um, no, that's not, that's exactly what I what I wanted to know. And um, and you know, you're making that job really easy because you're like completely segueing into all the things <laughs> I wanted to know. So so I know you talk a lot about your your grandmother and your mother, and you know the influence they had on your life and your food. So why don't you tell us about your mother? Oh, y'all gonna make me cry early. <laughs> <laughs> I see my producer Pat in the in the audience. He makes me cry all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Amanda. Um, I um, gosh, my mom. Oh, my biggest supporter, my best friend. Uh, my mom it, it was a single parent, and so she raised me. I would say by herself, but my grandmother had a lot to do with it. Um, so since she was a single parent, my my mother just. I mean, it was just me and her. You know, that's all I knew it was just me, her, and my grandmother. And so she just, she just had a wonderful role in my life. She, at one point, my mother worked three jobs to make ends meet. And um, I saw her, her hustle and her drive, and it just inspired me. And, yeah, that's my best friend. Uh, 
That's really nice. And t- and tell us about your grandmother and her like her journey from South Carolina and apparently back. Yes. Like, so my grandmother um, grew up on Wadmala Island with uh, 13 other siblings. It was 14 all together. They grew up in a little shack. It was two bedrooms. And um, it was my great-grandmother, Nuncie. I don't know if you see it in, her, in the book, Nuncie's Fried Chicken. <laughs> Can't go wrong. Um, <laughs> Uh, my grandmother grew up in a house with with Nuncie and her and her uh, her father, um, and it was and we called him affectionately called him Snookum, um, and it was them in this house. They grew up on a farm. It was a very small farm. My great grandfather um, Francis Robinson, he knit the he made fishing nets by mm-hmm. hand. Um, that was his way of living because there's you know we live we we go by saying we live by the land we live by the sea. And so in order to live, and especially on Watmala Island, which was very isolated back then, my grandmother lived, you know, she had, they had to eat what they grew on uh, land. They had to eat what they caught in the sea or the creek. Um, so my grandmother had very, very modest, a very, very modest upbringing. But she knew at an early age that she wanted more. Um, and out of all of her siblings, were the, she was the only one to say, I want to get a college education. Everyone thought she was crazy. Like, what do you mean you go into New York by yourself? No one's going to, you can't do that. You got to stay here, tend to the farm, mm-hmm. and become a house a housewife. That's, that's, that was the goal back then. But there was something in my grandmother that said, no, I want to go to New York. I want to make a, a, a living for myself, and I want to get an education. And um, eventually, fast forward, um, she became a, uh, a RN um, in, in Brooklyn. And she, once she became an RN, she decided to take her talents back to Charleston and finish raising my mother and my uncle. Um, and yeah, she's been back ever since. And, and tell us a little bit about how they influence the way that you cook. Oh, wow. Okay, so growing up in an African-American household, <laughs> you already know where I'm going. <laughs> you know where I'm going. Cheering don't belong in the kitchen. As my grandmother said, don't be muxing up <laughs> in my kitchen. And so I learned how to cook from afar. I could watch, I could ask questions, but as far as my hands in those pots, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I dare sneak a look or anything in those pots. So I learned from afar, but eventually, you know, I, I mean, but they... My grandmother and my mother were such great teachers. I mean, even though I could not physically be in the kitchen, like, you know, cutting or dicing and prepping, they answered a lot of my questions. And so because it was just me, you know, I had all of their attention. So it was pretty easy to kind of catch on. Uh, So eventually I was able to start cooking in the kitchen. And I had already had this vast knowledge of what to do from careful observation. And I'm a very inquisitive person. So I just kind of had the know-how. So I want you to recount the story of uh, when you made mac and cheese for the first time. But be, but before you get to that, yeah. did you know before you made that that you knew how to cook? Like, were you thinking, like, all right, when I get my chance? Or were you just sort of, like, surprised? Surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my sister, Evita, um, she is my half-sister. We share the same father. And I was at her house. Uh, I was 14, 15. Um, and or 14 or 15, I was at her house for the summertime, and we were all hanging out. There was her sisters, there were some cousins over there. Her mother, who um, has passed away, God bless the dead, Miss Arlene, was at the house, and we're all cooking, and it's like, we're just going to make it like a Thanksgiving dinner tonight. So you in charge of this, you're in charge of this. Cartier, you make the macaroni and cheese. And I'm like, who? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know how to make macaroni and cheese, right? Yeah, I got it. And so I called my grandmother on the phone. I was like, Grandma, Everyone's cooking, and they want me to make macaroni and cheese. And Grandma said, "Now, who? Arlene let you in her kitchen?" I said, "Yes." And you got to tell me what to what to get. She's like, "You get your evaporated milk. You get your your cheese. Don't buy the cheap stuff. Get the real the real craft extra sharp cheddar." <laughs> now, my grandmother was very particular about her cheese and stuff. Or some things you just don't you don't get the store brand of, and cheese was one of those things. Um, and she's like, you get the good cheese, you, you um, hand shred the cheese, you cube some of them, okay, okay, <laughs> make sure you got your unsalted butter, 
not margarine, butter. Um, and you add your milk and your salt and your pepper. You can put a little garlic powder if you want to in there. You got to have your eggs. <laughs> so I had my eggs. You know, that's a long debate. The two eggs or not to eggs for me. In my household, we put eggs in our macaroni and cheese. It's a casserole. Okay, so she, sh she taught me. She, she just went over it, over the phone. I said, like, okay, Grandma, I got it. I made it. Everyone loved it. So that was my start of, I can actually cook. So I went back to my grandmother. So I was like, Grandma, Vita and them said I can cook. So <laughs> <laughs> I can officially get in the kitchen. And so she allowed me just a little bit, but it took about 10 more years before I could <laughs> <laughs> officially, officially get in the kitchen. And, and did you have your next meal like in your head? You know, like when she lets me in there, I'm going to make. Oh, absolutely. I wanted to make everything. I mean, I, honestly, from that day, I, I really wanted to just cook. No matter what it was, if I, if I could just get up and make the, the bacon this morning, or can I scramble some eggs? Can I do something? Just let me in the kitchen. She did allow me to do certain things, but it, it, again, it was a while before I was just in the kitchen by myself. So, uh, you know, my experience is when people who aren't cooks or chefs talk to people who are cooks or chefs. They, they always ask them things like, you know, what's your specialty? And, and especially if you're cooking for a living, it's like, I don't know, what are you going to pay me for? But, <laughs> Absolutely. So, so I don't generally ask people that, but what I am interested in is, do you have a philosophy about how you cook or how you develop recipes mm -hmm. and, you know, and about how you look at food in general? Mm. Wow, that's the first time anyone has ever asked me that because it, it's normally the, gen, the, the very broad, what's your specialty? Like everything is my specialty. Anything I put my hand on is my specialty. <laughs> and, I, and I'm not, you know, saying that to be cocky, but I can burn. <laughs> you know? um, my philosophy on cooking is, is always, you know, you got to, and it's, this may sound very cliche, but you always have to cook from your heart. Because I can, I can tell when I'm not having a good day, my food tastes like I'm not having a good day. It's just, it just tastes like I threw it together. So my thing is always <laughs> lead, lead with love, lead with your heart. And whatever you produce, I've had so many people approach me about, you know, I can't cook this. And I, I mean, I, anything I touch just, just doesn't come right right. I tried your recipe. Like, look, look what you're starting with. Mm -hmm. Look what the attitude you're coming into the kitchen with. I just can't. Well, then it's going to taste like I just can't, you know? So I always say lead with your heart, you know, just have some type of excitement about what you're doing and it'll work. Just let it flow. Okay. So what, what I will ask you though, not, not what your specialty is, but if you are cooking somebody that you care about, what's your favorite meal to make? Ooh. <laughs> Woo, okay, so I do have someone I care about a lot. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> um, and he has a sweet tooth. Uh, so it's, um, and it's probably in the book. It is in the book, Brian Stump Cake. Um, so yes, it's so good. He loves it. I think I'm going to get a ring because of. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, but yeah, my you know it's it's cook their favorite if they if they if they have a sweet tooth you know make you make them something sweet um, but yeah just make sure it's seasoned and good. <laughs> yeah. And if somebody's cooking for you, what's your favorite thing to have somebody else make for you? Everything. Because <laughs> people are so afraid to cook for me. Even my mom has got to the point now. It's like I'm not making it. Mm -mm, you're too picky. And I'm not. It's not that I'm picky. It's just like you. You just kind of know mm -hmm. how things are supposed to taste. Um, and and even but even though I'm very appreciative if anyone decides to cook for me because I see cooking as an act of love. So if you take your time to cook for me, I appreciate it already because you didn't have to. So, yeah. Anything they want to make, I'll eat it. So one thing I noticed about your book, um, most cookbooks have a lot of head notes, <laughs> and your cookbook basically had no, head notes are the, that paragraph before the recipe that tells you something about it. 
and um, hers had yours had very um, few. The one that I really appreciated was about the boiled peanuts and your grandmother growing bo- growing peanuts. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, I love boiled peanuts and um, delicious. Um, <laughs> But but I so I don't know if that was like an editorial decision or it was on space or you just didn't feel you know you wrote the recipes that was all the writing you had in you. But if you if there were a recipe that you could go back and write a head note for, what 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 would it be? So I purposely didn't write head notes mm-hmm. for my recipes. I am I am of this thought. When I go to a recipe, I want the recipe. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean. It's like in the picture, you know, like I, I cannot, it just, it, you know, no, no shade as the kids say to people who want to write a whole two page dissertation about the recipe. Like one day I was driving to the mountains and I decided, like, okay, great. Jump to recipe. Mm-hmm. Because it's like, and that's, that's just me. You know, that's my style. I just want to get straight to it. Most people who are going to open this book need to make a dinner for a quick night or just want to get, just get straight into it. Now, and then, but you know, there are, are recipes that, you know, want, that, that may require a backstory. That's mm-hmm. why I wrote uh, a chapter opening mm-hmm. to kind of give you an idea about what you're going to explore in this chapter. Otherwise, I really want you to cook, you know, so let's get, let's get to cooking. <laughs> I, I have to say, I love head notes. Not, not, on, not online. Those things are terrible. Yes. But it, <laughs> no, really. But in a well-edited a well edited book, because I don't need that many recipes. What I want to know is, like, how does this recipe connect to you mm-hmm. or to something, you know, right. something other than, than the, um, but I respect your position. Okay. <laughs> and, and it made it much simpler to read the book. Yeah. I, will, I will say that. Um, so one of the things that I loved was when you were talking about talking to your aunt and um, about your life not going the way that you wanted it to, and and she said maybe God's trying to tell you something. Mm-hmm. And I have to tell you, like I I always think of that. I always think about that song, in in Color Purple. So like, you're younger than I am. I don't know if you've seen the Color <laughs> I Purple. I have. Yeah, yeah. So so yeah. A lot of times I'm just like thinking, you know, me and Andre Couch. Maybe God is trying to tell you something. Yeah. So and so I want to like. Maybe you could tell people a little bit about that crisis in your life, mm-hmm. and then. You know how you got through it. Ooh, very dark time in my life, and and before I decided to to what this book was going to be about, I always knew that if I got the opportunity to write a cookbook, that it was going to be a part autobiography, because I feel the world knows delicious Miss Brown, but what about Cartier? Why are you here? How did you get here? And I think that was a very important part of my life, and I I told my. Um, my team that I, I want to be as transparent as possible. I didn't want to hide anything because there's nothing to hide because what I've gone through is my testimony and my testimony may very well help someone else. And so that time in my life is where I was working as a social worker. Um, and if you've ever worked in social work, you get burnt out very, very quickly. Um, and I was right out of college, 22, 23, and I was working with kids that were just very, it was very hard to keep them in placements um, because they were the, the kids that were deemed just un, just unwanted because they mm-hmm. were behavioral issues, whatever it may be, and I was just tired. Getting phone calls on that, that phone, that on-call on phone at three o'clock in the morning. Are you a social worker? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Girl, you know that ringtone, you just know it's something terrible. At three o'clock in the morning, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have a runaway. You, you have a runaway. You're driving in your own personal vehicle trying to find this child. Okay, and so I, I got to the point where just something just wasn't right. And I started to have like pains in my neck because I, now I know it's from tension of just being like always on like this. And so I started having headaches and I started having like blackout uh, moments where I just would like kind of black out and pass out and I was like, okay, something's not right. Um, and I, I told my mom, like, you know, I, I don't think I can continue to work right now because I'm just not in the right headspace. And she said, whatever you need to do, just, just, you know, just stop. You got to get yourself together. So I quit my job or I went on a, a leave of absence and I had to move in with my mother. I lost my apartment because I wasn't able to work. 
Um, and I moved in with my mom and, you know, she kind of helped me through it, but it was very dark. We went to, before I even knew what was wrong with me, I went to psychiatrists, I went to psychologists, I went to counselors. No one knew what was wrong. Everyone just wanted to prescribe medicine. And, and this wasn't until I spoke to my aunt, my auntie Sharon, and she's a very spiritual person. And I said, auntie Sharon, there's, I don't know what's going on. She said, just stop. All of this is happening because there's something God is trying to tell you. And I was like, what is God trying to tell me? Like, what am I, what, what is it? I'm, I'm 20 at this time, I guess 25. I'm like, 25, why am I going through this at this age? Like, all of my friends are just like getting married and they're having fun. And I am going through this crisis. And she said, well, maybe God is telling you to move. Whatever direction you're going in is the wrong direction. She said, just take some time, read this book, um, and just let it come to you. And I was walking at a park one day, and I was still having these dizzy spells, and I was still kind of going through the motion. And I sat down, and I heard the word move. I'm like, now where am I going? I'm on kind of like disability. And like, <laughs> I'm like, where am I going? I have no money. Um, and just, you know, long story short, I got to New Jersey. I, I, I got there, and I was like, okay, I think I'm supposed to be here. Um, and I tell you, Valerie, Miss Valerie, I feel like I get, it's okay calling you Miss Valerie. Valerie. You'll find, okay. I'm Southern, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I got to New Jersey, and all of the feelings and everything that I was going through for almost two years went away. I was working at Big Brothers Big Sisters. I was in this, this, I was in Jersey, well, Newark at the time, and I was around so many different cultures and people, and it just felt right. And uh, fast forward to 2014, my ex-boyfriend at the time, <laughs> um, well, boyfriend, ex-boyfriend now, uh, signed me up to be on a show in, in Bayonne, New Jersey, where we were living at the time. And I, I think, I know to this day, had I not been in New Jersey, that opportunity to be on the cooking channel probably would have never happened. So that's why God said move. You need to be somewhere else. And so up till that point in your life, did you feel like you, I don't know, were listening to a higher power? Like, it, I mean, like maybe not as successfully as you'd wanted to, but... Were you doing that before, or was this just like an epiphany? You know what? No. I think I was just living. Just going, 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 going. And I had my own plan. I'm going to be the social worker. I'm going to get this degree. I'm going to save the world. And it was not a part of my purpose. Well, it, it was a part of my purpose in a sense because, you know, nothing happens by coincidence. Mm -hmm. But I was just living. I was, I was on a plan that I think was for someone else and not me. And, you know, you grow up in a household, especially where my grandmother was so big on education. It was like, you go get a degree, you work, you, retire, you work for 65 years, you retire, and then you start enjoying life. And, I mean, you know, okay. uh, she, mean, she meant well, you know, coming from that generation and that era, that, that is what made sense, you know. That was your trajectory, was to do that. And so I think I was just living to make my grandmother and my mother happy by going to college and, and doing so, social work. Um, it wasn't until I moved was, do I think that I was starting to listen to that higher power. I, I want to point out, though, that your life is not so different from your grandmother's. You know, like she wanted you to be on a certain path. Her parents wanted her to be on a certain path. Mm -hmm. And she had to make her own way. Yep. And she was successful, and you had to make your own way, mm -hmm. and you were successful. So, absolutely, you know. So she, maybe she she won't fuss at you. <laughs> I, I told her that. I said, Grandma, you know, I get I get my my willpower from you. I told her that recently. I said, Do you know that you were seventeen? You moved from Wadmala Island to Brooklyn, New York. Not people weren't doing that, and she had to actually go back to high school to reteach herself. Um, things that she wasn't taught in Walt Mala, mm -hmm. and then go to college and then take care of two kids. So I said, Grandma, I'm, I'm kind of doing what you're doing here. <laughs> you know, I'm being brave. I'm kind of, you know, but she, she didn't see it then, but she definitely sees it now. <laughs> so what's your spiritual pra practice like now? Oh, gosh. I am big on meditation. I am big on meditation, quiet time in the mornings before, you know, life gets started. I always take time to be in um, 
the present moment because I think a lot of times when we are constantly going in life we're never really in the present moment we're just going 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 so before that my day gets started I always just take time to to be and thank God for what is and um and throughout the day I just I just try to 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 lead my life by example and I pray often I pray all day long and I and I am constantly in gratitude and so I wanted to know, like, what, you know, where, where, what's your goal? Like, so what's your goal in career, in life, um, on a spiritual level? And w the things that you're doing now, how are they moving you toward where it is you want to be? So my, my spiritual goal, um, my goal in general, I think it's, it's all in one. I always tell people that it's not about the show. It's not about the cookbook. These are wonderful things. They're, they're you know, great in addition to. But I, I, I know in my heart of hearts that my mission is not um, just cooking. I, I believe my mission is, okay, yeah, cooking gets your attention. But my story is what really keeps you. And so my, my goal is to show people and others um, that th this life is possible, like, you know, coming from um, basically nothing and, and, and uh, obtaining things that you were once told wasn't attainable. Like, I'm living proof that it, it can happen. Um, so my life is to somehow, my, my, I believe my goal in life is to inspire, if it's just one person. Um, I, from, from talks during this book tour, I've inspired quite a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's my goal, is to keep doing that. I, my life is a, an act of service. Oh. <laughs> um, so just have a few more minutes before, before after that we'll open it up for questions. Um, but just in case people felt like there's not enough food in here, in this discussion, I want you to talk about a dish. Ooh, a I, dish? I, a dish. I don't care what dish. <laughs> Let's see what we can talk about. <laughs> what what y'all want to talk about? Well, look, the first thing I opened up was the sweet potato cheesecake. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So, you know, I, I love every section of this book, um, but the new gullah sub, uh, the new gullah section is is one that's near and dear to my heart because it pays uh, homage to the foods that I grew up eating in Charleston, in the Low Country, but it's also, um, I had a traveling supper club a few years ago. Some may know, some may not. It's called the New Gala Supper Club. Um, and that's how I got my start in the food world. I literally, um, seeing people last, I had a, a, an event in Greenville uh, two days ago. Was it two days ago? Yeah, two days ago. <laughs> Everything is running together at this point. Um, and I, there was a room full of 80 people eating my recipes. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I remember there was a time when I, were, I was begging people to come to my supper club. Like, you may not know me, but I cook this food and I really want you guys to try it. I remember my first few supper clubs, people were like, what's gula? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I get that too. Yeah, what's gachi? And, and oh, what's gachi? Yeah, <laughs> get a and lot so, of what's gachi. But they, they, they just—they were so fascinated. But, but people were very open-minded to it. Um, but yes, this entire section—it's a lot of—it's a lot of rice because that's we're a rice culture. Um, there's a lot of seafood, um, and I always tell people if you don't if you don't like seafood or if you don't have access to fresh seafood like me, substitute it for poultry or just you know mm -hmm. vegetize it. Yeah. So yeah. Well, I, 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 I want to tell you, I am going to be at Charleston Wine and Food in March, in March. With, with BJ. Oh, BJ, that's my boy. You guys know Chef BJ Dennis. He is uh, kind of like the, the gatekeeper yeah, <laughs> of, yeah, of, of, yeah, of Gullah Geechee food right now. He, he is amazing, and I'll, I'll be there too, so I can't wait All to right. see you. <laughs> It'll be great. First of all, hey, cousin. Hey, cousin. <laughs> I just want to say, I've been watching the Food Network for a very long mm -hmm. time, and I'm just so proud of you. Oh, thank you. A woman of color, young, doing your thing, you share your stories, and by the way, I've, 
I have to say, oh, you come to my house on Sunday? My granddaughter coming to my house on Sunday. She like, you don't got Cartier on? <laughs> because literally, this is what I do on Sunday. Like when oh, you made wow. the steakhouse burger, I think it was. Uh -huh. I was like, What's I got to run and get that right now. I got to go get that bacon. <laughs> get Because I'm telling that Zach and the Mac and cheese. I got everybody in my house on that. So that's all I want to say. Cousin. God bless you. Yes. Oh, thank you. And you do not have a granddaughter. <laughs> what? <laughs> wow, you look good. Thank you. Hey, cousin. Hey, cousin. I, the first time I ever saw you where you were on a show with Nancy, Nancy Fuller. Nancy Fuller. Yeah. That's the first time I ever saw you. I've been watching you ever since. Oh, thank you. But I just wanted to say I'm... You hit the nail on the head when you said you were having all these pains and aches and pains and blackouts. I'm having the same thing. Mm. And I'm about 30 years into my career. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say what it is, but um, mm -hmm. it's time to go. It's yep. time for me to go. Yep. So you just enlighten me yep. to make that move. Yep. And I'm starting a catering business. So can you <laughs> shut your catering business out? What's the name of it? You actually said it tonight, so that even put the nail in the coffin. You said can't go wrong. Oh when you said that, that's oh. the name of my business. Look, can't you see go wrong. So it's like you're touching every everything. Mm -hmm. It's making me have to say so long to my career that I had. And, and trust but, that everything will fall into place. Yes. Thank yeah. you. One question. Yes. You did catering, right? I'm sorry, can you? You had, had a catering. I did. I catered too. Yep. So what did, how did you start? Uh, so I got, you know, social media is a wonderful thing these days just because when you cook and cook and cook and you post pictures of food, people will just automatically, you know, go into your DMs like, hey, do you cater? And the first time that happened to me, I was like, yeah, never catered in my life. <laughs> I said, I cater now. Yeah. What you need? <laughs> and so that kind of started me. You know, um, in the South, you, you have to have like a cottage license or something like that to start off. But just start cooking, you know, and, and, and the clientele will come. One person will tell the next person about how good your food was. And I, I actually, but then I also did work as a driver. When I quit my job in social work, I moved back to um, South Carolina. And I also worked as a driver for another catering company. So I would drop their food off, but I saw how they prepared it. And I saw how I was supposed to set up. So I kind of had the know-how, but never really did it myself. But if I said, if I can drive the food, why not? I, I can do the same thing for my, own, for my own company. And so that's what I did. I can't. OK. <laughs> um, everything you do is a huge inspiration, um, from the TV to social media, everything. I am an up and coming um, chef or cook. And I guess one of my questions is, how did it feel when you first got started? What did that jolt of excitement feel like? What, what really kind of sent you, sent you off? Well, it was the fact that I was now waking up when I wanted to wake up. And I was answering to myself and my mom a little bit. Um, <laughs> but that gave me motivation. It was like, I'm doing this for myself now, you know, like uh, it's, it's for me. And so it was, it was hard, right. very hard. There was times where I'm like, yeah, I'm excited. I got $12 in the bank. God, <laughs> you know? And so it, it got to those points where like I was broke, but I was working for me. This is for me. So that's what, what kept me motivated. That's what kept me going when times got hard. It's like, okay, at the end of the day, this is what I'm doing for myself. So that's what, what kind of kept me with that hurrah spirit. Other than that, it was just, it would have been kind of hard. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, thank you. I appreciate you being here and just answering our questions. So, oh, thank, thank you. you. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> um, <laughs> what I really wanted to say is that um, my husband and I enjoy watching you. So oh, we, we sit you. in bed and watch on Sundays, and oh. we've made a couple of your uh, recipes the Hop and John Ooh, yes. and the uh, Codfish Sandwich are two oh, of our favorites yeah, that we've made. Favorite. Um, and I just want to say that you really are an inspiration. And he tags me all the time on some of your uh, Instagram 
pictures as oh. well. And, and <laughs> like we make this. And, yes, make this. Right, make this. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to say it's really an inspiration to watch you oh, and to you. see that here in person is just like you are on the TV. Which oh, is the best. I, 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 I'll tell people that all the time. They're like, you are really who you are. Yeah, you really I said, are I don't get, who you I are. don't feel like I get enough. Like, I want to really show you who I am. But we would, it's not, it's we get 30 minutes. I, I can't. <laughs> so I'm excited to try some more of the recipes. And just two side notes, can't go wrong. This is a sign for you. You need to go and do it. And Miss Valerie, I dance with your sister, Micheline. Oh. <laughs> Look at that small I have girl. a lot of sisters. All right. I'm going to stay in. How are you? Hey, cousin. Hey, cousin. Your real cousin sitting right here. Well, she's going to talk to you a little later. <laughs> Linda. <laughs> hey, Linda. <laughs> so, super excited as echoing everyone else is saying as you are an inspiration, um, able to see reflection of yourself on national and local television. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a proponent of mentorship. And similar as you gave advice to two of the, or three of the young ladies who stood up. I have a sister who's a young chef who I've seen her story in your story. Mm -hmm. And she is going through ebbs and flows of can I do this, can I not, in a male-dominated world. Mm -hmm. And so, and then connecting that to your boys and girls club that you were in, mm -hmm. has there been a space for thought in your heartbeat of mentorship? And if so, I got a name for you. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm always open to taking um, people, women, men, whatever, under my wing because when I started in this business, it wasn't as open. You know, that's the thing. Everything is not a competition. What's for you is gonna be for you. What's for me is gonna be for me and there's enough. You know? So I'm always, I'm always, and it's so funny that you say that because I, I've, there's been something on my heart for the longest. And especially when it comes to food television, um, there's not a lot of us in that world, you know? And, and, and I'm not, it's not always about a black or a white thing because we don't live in a black and a white world. But it is known fact that an African American woman, especially, we, we don't get those opportunities as often. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I've always wanted to kind of take un people under my wing, like, hey, don't be afraid to step into culinary producing. Don't be afraid to step into um, anything. You know, like, it's, it, it, you get in a culinary degree or, or cooking, it's not just about catering or making plates. There's a world of opportunity within this field, but it's, it's just not often talked to us about. Or if there is opportunity, it's like kind of hush-hush thing, you know, oh, I'll tell a friend to tell a friend, but I won't tell the world about it. No. I am completely opposite of that, and I and I yes, we'll connect. Thank you, thank you, uh, absolutely. I I just want to say I'm not on television, but I am local. All right. <laughs> so, yes. All right. So I, you, I mean, you can I, I can give you my card, or you awesome. can always find me on Instagram and Facebook at Geechee Girl Cafe, and um, you know, and I'll answer. And, <laughs> good. Yes. Yes. Hi, Cartier. Okay. Hey. Hi. Hey. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, you got me through the pandemic, Sundays Aww. and Tuesdays. Um, and I will say, my I text my mom and I told her I was here, and she said, "Oh, I remember her. She made the sweet potato cheesecake that she wanted, <laughs> and you just opened it to it." But I did want to ask a question because um, I don't often cook while I'm watching your show. Mm -hmm. But tell us more about the house seasoning, how you came <laughs> to it, yeah. and the exact recipe. Is it in the book? <laughs> yes. So the exact recipe is in the book. It's kind of like the first page because I use the house seasoning on everything. So I realized after cooking, I put the same spices into everything. Got my garlic powder, got my onion powder, got my paprika, got my salt and my pepper. I was like, hmm, this is a season all. And I keep it in the house. House seasoning. <laughs> And also, to, and to, to my producer, is like, we keep using <laughs> the same ingredients, so we need to kind of like coin this uh, because it really is just a seasonal. It goes well on poultry, goes well on seafood, um, it goes well on vegetables. So, yeah, that's the birth of the house seasoning. Hey. Hi, cousin. Hey, you look like my mom with those glasses and that cut. Listen, <laughs> yeah. and I know your mom. Oh, okay. And I, I grew up with your Aunt TC. Oh, yes. And I am a Charleston girl. Yes. Just came back from Charleston yesterday. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I just want to thank you for being such an inspiration. 
oh, just watching you. your show every Sunday. And I'm waiting for the great soul food cook-off mm -hmm. second edition. <laughs> We're trying to get that back. Um, it, it wasn't picked up for the second season, but I know. I don't, y'all, y'all, if I could go into detail. <laughs> but we're, we're trying to bring it back to Discovery Plus eventually, but um, it, it'll be a season two somehow, some way. Yes. Mm -hmm. We need it. We are so excited to have you here in Philadelphia. And I want you to know, I'm not a big cook. Okay. So when I can make something that you do on Sunday, I'm very, very proud of myself. Oh, yay! <laughs> and so I made your shrimp and grits, and I took pictures and showed my two nieces because they're great cooks, and I'm oh. not, but they feed me all the time, so God bless them. <laughs> and, and so I want you to know we're very, very proud of you, and Thank I'm you. really good friends with Jared and DeAndre and Braylon Washington in Charleston, oh, your biggest little fan. Yeah. Yes, Braylon. Yes, yes. And also, is the house finished? Ooh. <laughs> oh, gosh. So, I let me, honesty hour, full transparency. When we decided to, when I decided to, to move, um, you know, everyone loves the house on Edison. The, ho the house is still within the family. It's still there. Um, but it was like, you know, it's, it's beautiful. But my life, you know, and you guys have seen the journey from, you know, when I was doing Cartier's Cuisine on Instagram, and then it, when it became Delicious Miss Brown, and you know, my life is, is growing, and, and, and you know, I have someone very, very special that I now share my life with, and so it just only made sense to have something we both can call home. So, <laughs> and not to mention it's a beautiful house. So, I mean, the house on Edison is beautiful too, but this one is like something that I had I was able to put my, you know, my very own touches from the very beginning, and it still sits on very rich land. It was once an indigo um, uh, plantation. And so, you know, when you think about it, this land was once where my ancestors lived, and they were, didn't live there by choice. <laughs> and so now I'm able to call this land and this home mine, and I'm there by choice, you know? So, and, and, and to answer your question, the house, I'm closing on the house on my birthday, November 16th. Yay! I'm so excited. You should see the kitchen. Hello. Um, not so much a question, but I just wanted to share that uh, my whole family loves you. So oh, I'm here with thank my, you. my husband, our five-year-old, and our three-week-old. We were like, we're not going to miss you. Oh, wow. <laughs> we're not going to miss you. We, were, we, we had to come, and we discovered you um, in on a vacation in Myrtle Beach, and we binge watch you, <laughs> oh. the, the delicious Mrs. Brown, and um, I have a similar story, family in, from Green Pond, South Carolina, who uh -huh. moved up to Brooklyn, and I grew up in Jersey, and I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm really like seeing you, you know, seeing myself in you, and we just yes. love you, we just want to say, we're proud of you, like everyone else did, so thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, cousin. Uh, so, Cartier, yes. Miss Brown, we are so happy that you came. Thank you very much. Um, you. If you have a book, uh, there will be a book signing, I think, on the first floor. And if you don't have a book, you can buy a book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Hold on. I want to do one thing before y'all walk out. Hold on. We're going to do, a, gonna do like a selfie video. And what do y'all want to say? <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's it. Okay. Turn on self, okay. Hey. So on the count of three, we're gonna say hey cousin, okay? Yes. Alright. Alright. One, two, three. Hey!